Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 596. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and today's May 12th, 2020. All right, welcome to another show, kind of a spring show here, because outside the Anglican TV studios, I see the sun is shining. But because it's spring, it's windy, and there's uh, blustery stuff blowing around, and there's no lawnmowers today, kind of a miracle. So it's it's a miracle in Connecticut. Uh, before we get too far, I want you guys to like the show, uh, either on Facebook or YouTube. If you have not recently shared the show with your friends and family and all the clergy you know, just click that little URL, copy and paste it and send it along. Go to the comment sections because the show continues there. If you want to comment on the show, especially any topic we talk about, we're going to have some tougher topics today and I'm sure you guys are going to want to go and tell us what you think and we read them all so we appreciate that very much. If you had not subscribed yet you want to get instant notifications when this show is uh, live click the little subscribe uh, red rectangle when that little bell comes up after that you click on that and you will be notified instantly this is what I'm told of any YouTube uh, notifications regarding Anglican TV also, if you check the show notes, we have a podcast uh, that we publish along with this. So you don't have to sit there and stare at two faces talking to you about news <laughs> Anglican-wise around the world. George, how you been doing? Just fine. Just fine. Life yeah. is beautiful down here in Florida. Even though the church is closed uh, until at least after Memorial Day, the bishop tells us, I don't think I've ever been busier. <laughs> <laughs> with all the work that has to be done to to turn out uh, live streams, do pastoral work, and and just make, keeping the keeping the thing and you know, keeping the thing alive. Well, I gotta say, I watch all these uh, um, the cam work from around the communion, and these guys are getting better and better and better. As far as priests, you may be an okay priest, but you guys are turning out to be wonderful videographers and cinematographers. Uh, I've not seen a a bad one since week three. Uh, and th that's saying a lot because week two, a lot of people had their little iPhones and were looking up the nostril. That wasn't so good. Uh, week one, the phone was falling over. Uh, we had uh, George's wife telling me about all the fun bloopers that uh, she's been uh, recording with George uh, pulling his microphone out of the camera. And all that seems to be now we're into week, what, almost eight. Things are settling down. And we have. I hate to use the word, arrived at this new normal. And now we're just reacting to uh, kind of that hope that we're, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, that there's a day that we can say, all clear, the, the Nazis have stopped bombing us, we can come out of our shelters, and uh, it's time to begin life again. But what will we find when we That's come right. out of the shelters? <laughs> Jeez. Well, some things are... are I, I think the first story I, I wanted to talk about was the uh, the shooting in Georgia. Uh, I've not commented on this at all on Facebook. I've kind of kept ab above the fray because I just remember going through the Rodney King issue, the Trayvon Martin issue. This sometimes it's just best just to to sit back and watch and not participate in the the Facebook fray of. Uh, Everybody's an expert now on racism, where last week they were an expert on pandemics, the week before they were an expert on economies, and the week before that they were an expert on on oh, what, everything. And so I just I stayed out of this uh, just because I wanted to take the, the higher ground. Now it's kind of time to talk about it because I want to give you the bigger picture uh, of this. And here's the, the bigger picture. If this had occurred, had occurred 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 150 years ago 200 years ago the, the reaction would have been different because i think this nation is much less racist i think if this happened 50 years ago you know the liberals would have been upset um a few yale professors would have written some papers uh it would have made the news but not to the extent it has now if this happened a hundred years ago I doubt it would have made the national news. 
Um, it would have been something they reported here in the Northeast. Uh, it's something that nobody around the world would have known. If this happened 150 years ago, the town folk, they would have heard about it. That's it. But the reaction we have around the world shows that we're not going to tolerate this anymore. This is ridiculous. We don't uh, uh, at all want to see racism in our culture. And I think racism is a shadow of what it has been. Do we have racism? Sure we do. Will we always have racism? Yeah, it's a broken, fallen world. We're always going to have some degree of bias and racism. It's, it's part of our brokenness. Are we the racist we used to be uh, before the Civil War? No. I, I don't think it's, it's even close. However, it's just like reading stories of climate change. Everything is climate change. Everything is global warming. Uh, oh, we, we're one degree cooler this year. Well, that's climate change. <laughs> you know, that's because we have too much pollen in the, or pollution in the air. And we look at these stories and we say everything's racism. And I, I got to tell you, not everything is racism. Not everything is climate change. Uh, we, we can't just sit there and uh, have this virtual signaling. And I think I see a lot of virtual signaling on Facebook over this. And oddly, uh, with some act of clergy. Yeah. Uh, for, you know, I some of the Kool-Aid has slipping into the water in the ACNA. See, I don't see why some people are in the ACNA and not in the Episcopal Church. See, you can be a creedal, orthodox Episcopalian. Who drinks the Kool-Aid daily. Who drinks the Kool-Aid daily. <laughs> or you can be a creedal, orthodox Episcopalian who doesn't drink the Kool-Aid. But there's, and we're in the minority, those who do not drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> there are some acne clergy who have drunk the Kool-Aid who I don't see why they're in the ACNA because they're so far out into some of these critical race theories and just into the... Uh, it's a hard I, topic. I know. <laughs> well, it's a hard... Uh, because I'm offering an opinion and I'm not, I'm not speaking to... And speaking yeah. to fact. See, on, on this Georgia shooting, I remember the Trayvon Martin case. Mm -hmm. And what we now know now is totally different what we knew then. And we've had, and the people who were marching with uh, Al Sharpton now basically were taken for a ride. And I don't know what happened in South Georgia. I know it was a tragedy. Sure. I know lives have been destroyed and ruined and I, and I pray God, you know, heal that, uh, the brokenness there. But what I've seen on Facebook uh, has, uh, in commentary from some ACNA clergy just makes me think these guys just don't know any better. They, they, uh, they don't seem to have a sense of pastoral maturity or wisdom to understand that people are fallen, people are broken, and that if you run too quickly with a single cause that, all, that there are, is only one variable in life, whether that variable is racism mm -hmm. or climate change or mm -hmm. sexuality. Okay, don't bang their table. I got my <laughs> your mic goes right to my ear. Ow. <laughs> so I'm not smart enough to get into the, the wrongs of critical race theory, but when people start telling me that, you know, you, Marx was right on this and that. You can't do the other <laughs> stuff. I'm thinking, well, and this is unkind, but I'm thinking, well, Mussolini made the trains run on time. Uh, it's just not a good enough reason to bring up something that is that is antithetical to the whole Christian ethos. No, w woke is a heresy, and uh, it has nothing to do with the the biblical understanding of creation. And so. so, on the Georgia thing, I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. I pray that the justice department justice takes its course and the truth be laid out soberly, rationally, and evildoers be punished um, if the, and leave it there. Yeah. But where I'm concerned is that some of the ACNA bishops are not minding the store. We've got, we, that... they, they're basically letting, I'm not in the ACNA, so at the end of the day, it doesn't <laughs> matter to me. But if you guys decide to go off the cliff, uh, 
I can point to uh, I could point well, to the, an organization that has preceded you down the path into total irrelevance <laughs> and destruction. Yeah, that's right. Well, it, it's kind of the evolution also of Facebook. I remember when Facebook first came out. If you were a, a bishop or a clergy, you you had to be on Facebook to keep in, in more and more in touch, and it was something new and fun. Uh, I don't see any. ACNA Facebooks regularly, ACNA bishops regularly on Facebook. I see a lot of the younger, uh, thirty and under, thirty-five and under clergy on Facebook, and but it's, well, I can't because think the that, older bishops have learned the virtue of keeping their mouths shut. The, they have learned the virtue of not virtue signaling. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and in other words, it, maybe it takes experience to realize that not everyone wants to know your thought on every single issue. Or how you are so great, brave, and great and true because you think these good thoughts that the majority of the mob also thinks, mm -hmm. and the mob will be doing something different tomorrow. Yeah. Um, one of the I had I was training a, a woman to be a deacon. She was in that age group, and she was twittering and writing political things. And I said, "Look, if you're going to be in my church, you can talk about anything you want about Jesus Christ. But the moment you step into politics, you got to find another church." Because our church has as many Democrats as we have Republicans. We have as many political liberals as political conservatives. If you decide that you are going to support one side and that's where God is truly to be found, then you have no place in my church because that's not how, that, you know, Christ did not come to give the Democrats or the Republicans the advantage in the next election. Amen. You need to find a new vocation if that's what you think the church is about. So that's all on racism for this week. Let's move on to a different topic. So, Kevin, are we for <laughs> or against racism? So, uh, uh, just to make sure that we don't have anybody. World. Yeah, okay, yeah. Just, um, we are incredibly opposed to any bias that would set anybody above or below anybody else. For God views us equally, so do George and I. However, because we're fallen people, we have our built in biases. <sighs> It is what it is. Work with it. At the end of the day, your job is to worship and glorify the Father. Okay. So, evil yeah. exists. Yeah, it, it, you have a duty in this world yeah. to steer around evil and lead people to Christ. That's our job. We're yeah. not God. Uh. Thank God we're not talking about feminism this week. You know, it's just, so let's talk about reopening the church. Um, I talked about the light at the end of the tunnel. It seems that the governments around the world are starting to ease up. Certainly the states in America south of the, uh, the Mason-Dixie line are saying, hey, it's time to open up. And I think we need to talk about how we're going to open up churches especially with the eye on how we're going to do it in social distancing realm. How do we keep that six foot barrier around us? And uh, do we take out pews? Does everybody come with a big hula hoop around them so nobody comes within the, the you know, bumps into them? Does everybody wear full face mask and gloves during service? George, have you given any thought to this? Yeah, and I'm, I'm discouraged. Yeah. Um, and it's because of demographics. My county is the fourth oldest in the United States in terms of the age of the population, I think. And so we don't have a naturally large base of young people. My daughter who lives out in uh, the Los Angeles area. She go, She's going to a church that, you know, 20s and 30 year olds at the max, you know, the most, and they're going to pack it in again because they, they think they're going to live forever. My congregation reflects my community. It's older. We have people. I'm one of the younger people. Uh, and my congregation are deathly afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, I have neighbors in the cul-de-sac where I live. We're the youngest. And Kevin, you visited my for house. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. We see You see all the people tooting around in their golf carts, yeah. taking their dogs for walks, mm -hmm. talking to the neighbor this morning. Uh, Susan and I mentioned we'd been out to a restaurant. They're not going out until they all clear and they don't what is going to happen you, you can turn that off there <laughs> call from tulsa oklahoma Ooh, oh. who might that be well where i'm going with this is i look at the restaurants business and i read an article about restaurants in shanghai 
the western area. The Chinese government shut them down in January. They've been allowed to reopen now for about three weeks. These are the restaurants that cater to the new middle class, upper classes of China. They reopened only 10% capacity after three, four weeks. People are still afraid. Now they may come back, but a restaurants cannot make a profit. Uh, with that, with our, in our state, 25% capacity is the limit on restaurants. You can't make an, you, can, you know, with the restaurant industry having margins about 9%, you can't make money with only a quarter of your seats filled. In my church, we make the bulk of our money in the season, uh, November to May. Uh, it's because when the people are here, if I take out uh, half of my chairs, I'm going to have to have eight services to get the same traffic through the building that I did before. And the traffic drives the income. How are we going to be able to make the wheels the, the wheels mesh. Now, we'll be okay because we're the largest and the most well organized of our Episcopal churches in our area. But my neighbors to the east or west, they're about half or the size of we are, and they had their sort of up to here anyway sure. before COVID-19. How are they going to reopen? Now, they can reopen the doors, but how are they going to survive six months out? I don't that, know. That's it. I mean, we have age in the age of COVIDism. You know, uh, this is the disease that we're going to find who were supporting our economy, who are supporting our churches, who are supporting the grocery stores, the restaurant business. And I don't think the young people uh, are going to be able to support it all. Because uh, when here in, you know, I live in a 55 plus community, uh, it's not official, but <laughs> most of my neighbors are 55 plus. Uh, you go to the restaurants, it was the, the older generation, the bar across the street, you go in there and there's 35 people at the bar, they're all over 55. And they would go there and they would support the economy and they would support the churches. And that's the, the big thing here. Even if there was an, uh, a reopening and uh, they, they said, you, know, you can open the churches, you gotta have social distancing. I don't think anybody over 55 or 60 is going back to the churches until there's a vaccine. Now, and I, and I, yep, go ahead. Oddly enough, our income is has remained okay. I mean, okay, we haven't seen a drop in income, and it's because people are mailing it in. Now, so so far so good. But how long will that stay continue? Hmm. Because I, what I'm finding is that people, members of my congregation, are watching our show on Sunday, but they're also watching other shows. Sure. What is going to happen over the months to come when, when people have not the physical, tactile presence in a church, but they like George's sermon, they like the music at this church, they like the set at that church? How, are we, you know, there's one of the buzzwords uh, from my youth were paradigm shifts. Sure. Are we in a paradigm shift where the old model of church no longer meets the current realities? What's this new paradigm going to look at? Are people going to basically become even more private in their religiosity and pick and choose more succinctly, you know, more directly, and direct their funding accordingly? And are people going to have the same experience at a church where they have to wear a mask, they have to wear gloves, they're not allowed to hug at the peace, uh, any conversation? No coffee hour. No coffee hour. Uh, is that going to be the same experience as it was before? Maybe they're just going to prefer, you know, I went to church for two weeks in a row. It just wasn't as fun as it used to be. I just didn't feel uh, like I was glorifying God. I'm going to enjoy Facebook in my pajamas and watch George uh, George's sermon live. Why, why go to church? Well, oof. We, uh, our, my parish had the distinction of being the only parish in our diocese to have positive growth for the, every year for the last seven years, and we've doubled in size. Mm -hmm. And we, the vestry are quite, uh, and I, I'm, a big, I'm a big guy. I look at statistics, I look at attendance, I look mm -hmm. at individual attendance and this and that. And so we really do have a handle on things. We know what keeps people, we know what attracts people, and it's a combination of two things. In our case, it's we do good worship well. People like the sermons. We have an excellent musician, organist. 
but people also like the sense of community they get by being with others. Um, half of that's now gone. Is, is, I hate to say this, am I or is any other priest enough to carry the show that makes a church successful? Now, okay. short of those church that are personality cults where the minister is God himself, you know, Jim Jones types, <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> what's, how, what is the new paradigm going to be when community, t the physical presence of community where you can sit down and meet someone you've not met before or meet a newcomer to the community and sit down and have coffee with them aft and be able to discuss what you've just witnessed and participated in in your faith life, that half is gone. And friends, I don't see Zoom being uh, being a substitute. There's there's a clever series of commercials put out by Progressive Insurance. I love the, that. Oh, they're the, awesome. The flow people were basically <laughs> show all the sort of the how Zoom is so flat and one dimensional. And so it's no substitute. No, it's not. So here's your, we're at the end of the show now. We, we've done our 20 minutes, but you as the viewer, I want you to go to the comment section, especially your clergy. Tell us what you're afraid of with the reopening of the church and tell us any ideas you have for how to do this. How do you want to bring uh, the, the older generation back to your church, back into this community when we're still facing this threat of a pandemic and the threat of COVID and the threat of, uh, you know, ARDS. Can I uh, just touch on some of the, the news around this issue? Sure. Um, we had the Do Church it. of England. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had the Church of England announce that uh, they're going to follow the government guidelines. And so the earliest you will have Sunday public worship is July 5th. Um, we've also had uh, stories, uh, people, t you know, one of the archdeacons in the Diocese of London and another in Southwark could say, you know, confidentially that, uh, well, they could have up to 70% of their churches unable to reopen. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because the, of the, the little churches, the ones mm -hmm. that were basically struggling, what are we going to see in the United States? Uh, our diocese, Central Florida, basically Bishop two weeks ago told us nothing until after Memorial Day, and we'll look at the end of May to see what we can do. Mm -hmm. But if when we do reopen, you know, social distance guidelines, reduced seating like restaurants, face masks, no coffee, no peace, no hugging. How's that going to work exactly? Right. And there, and so and then then we go to the other extreme. Um, the uh, at Kenya, the the one diocese, some diocese in Kenya have basically furloughed everybody. That's right. The bishop, including the bishop. They don't. They live week to week on offerings. There are no offerings because the churches are closed. Uh, there's tremendous unemployment now in East Africa and West Africa, and the churches that the, the states that aren't following this. Tanzania, the uh, the president of Tanzania is a Christian, uh, and he said that uh, he's not going to close the churches because the power of God is stronger than the power of the COVID virus. Therefore, God is not going to affect anybody who goes to church. Okay. Um, <laughs> they, that mindset is good in the short term, mm -hmm. but what if we do have a pandemic start there? Yeah. And in other words, Tanzania is applying the Swedish model. Uh, so we have churches that are not only do we have sort of the culture shift of people losing the habit or losing or not seeing the need, what am I getting out of going to a clergy centric organization? Whereas for the past three, four, five, six months, I've been basically developing my spirituality with my Bible and my family or my tribe or my, my group community. What's happened when those fall away plus the financial uh, underpinnings fall away? Yeah. Are we going to see a paradigm shift? And I think we are. I just don't know what the future is going to look like. Well, I think a year from now, we're going to find a lot fewer churches. The, the churches that were on the borderline, on the cusp of financial viability, that they didn't make it. Uh, I'm assuming uh, three or four major airlines are not going to make it. 
Uh, I think travel is going to be absolutely decimated for two or three years. Uh, tourism, places like Walt, I mean, is there a paradigm shift? Absolutely. And I think it's going to affect on so many different spiritual levels, economic Did, levels, government, think, politic levels. I think, you know, in our area, Walt Disney World is the large, in our diocese, Disney yeah. World, in Florida, I think even the United States, Disney it's World is the largest single point. site employer. Yeah with tens of thousands of people working there. You know, they, the Disney model of people coming to a theme park and amusement park, which grandparent in their right mind are going to take their children who's until gonna, this is all going, up, going who's, away. Who's gonna sit and watch football on a Sunday where there's a huge play, they're going back, they're throwing the Hail Mary, and there's just no crowd noise to support the excitement you're seeing. How, how, it's well, not the I same. Up, I grew up supporting the Philadelphia Eagles, so Kevin, that's <laughs> it's right. nothing new. Uh, <laughs> but what I know that Broadway yeah. is closed until next year because yeah. the the theaters are closed, the movie theaters are closed. What's Hollywood going to do? It's everything going to be straight to DVD now. Um, at, well, so many businesses, apart from the church, are going through par these paradigm shifts of what are their models of uh, distribution of their product and will people still want their product? How will restaurants survive? How will the theaters, movies, uh, theme parks, the tourism business, tourism's a major industry here in Florida. Hawaii's got 25% unemployment mm -hmm. because nobody can, nobody's going to the island. Yeah, uh, my dentist sent a letter saying she's going to reopen May 20th. She's all excited. We're finally gonna have customers back in. But all the hygienists in uh, Connecticut, I'm not going to put my finger in somebody's mouth to clean it, you know. And so there's there's a revolt going on as to how these businesses are going to open when workers don't want to really conduct business the way they used to. I went to the skin doctor yesterday. About every six months, they slice another part of me off. You live in Florida. Uh, <laughs> I live in Florida, and I was chatting with him, and of course, he's had to shut his doors because. He's a non-essential medical personnel. They've just been allowed to reopen. Um, I was the only, usually when I go, it's Florida. Dermatologists <laughs> are packed with old people having parts of their ears and nose sliced off. I'm starting that process. He's the only one there. Yeah. And he had, you know, I was looking back, he's got maybe 30 staffers and three partners. Everybody's standing around. He's got to pay them. How is he going to make it? And so I'm going in and he looks me over and basically I decided to give him business. Yeah, you could take that one off. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> and I had a yeah. scratch over here. Just get a yeah, slice of this. Yeah, do a biopsy. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. So it, I know this is silly, but churches and dermatologists and theme parks, we have parishioner who runs a uh, swim with the manatees. Hmm. Uh, He's basically out of business because he's had boat payments to make for three months. He can't make them. He doesn't, you know, he makes five, six, he makes a thousand dollars a weekend taking people out. No people That's to take out. Yeah. Hey, thing, things have changed. All right. Hopefully we haven't depressed you. That's not the, the nature of the show. That's to uh, help you think about what's going on, uh, keep you informed about what's going on, and allow you to comment and tell us what's going on. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 596 of Anglican Unscripted.